Okay, morning everybody. So what I was going to do today was to spend the first 10 or 15 minutes going through a detailed uh, um, pie example, just to try to go to the, the relevant points. Sorry this isn't particularly legible, but hopefully it's legible on the screen. Uh, I, I'm using guest 35. Apologies if somebody is using guest 35, but I've, I've stuck it in the subdirectory, so um, if you're guest 35, you see some random files appearing, apologies for that. So I've got this uh, tar file, which is MPP pie, which I got from the website. So if I just unpack it, you'll see that there's, um, I'll, do the, I'll do the C version, just for the sake of argument. And there's a C version there, pi serial.c. So if I look at that, um, you'll see that it just does the um, the obvious thing, the compute pi. And the only the only um, issue for C programmers is the loop does go from one to n, uh, not from naught to, to n minus one. And so um, I'll, I'll not. And it prints an error here. So I compute the exact value of pi as 4.0 times a times 1.0. And actually, the expansion we're using is just an expansion for the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is a times 1 as well. And I print out an error. So this is just a simple serial code. It's no big deal there. Um, let's look at the parallel code. And it has been written to sort of, uh, let me take the, it's been written to hopefully illustrate most of the, the issue. So let's make it um, so I'm getting all these weird um, so we, we include the normal stuff at the start. Apologies to the um, MPI.h here, and we have some we have some standard sort of um, variables that we need. MPI variables. We have MPI com, common MPI status status. So things like communicator and the status, as I said, in the C version are are type gaps. They'll just be I don't know if they have there's some 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 structure or something like that. Um, the status is definitely a structure. In Fortran, these are integers, except in the modern Fortran interface, the MPI FOA interface. Um, that is just the same as the C interface, but it would be type of MPI com com type MPI status status. So the, the more modern Fortran, the most modern Fortran interface uses um, Fortran derived types in the same way as, as, as type that is used in C here. And it basically, so if you want to know what the Fortran interface it would be just type MPI com com type MPI status status. But in the most commonly used Fortran interface, these are just integers. And so then I just carry on, and I do the normal. So here, it might seem strange that I have a print statement here, but I've deliberately put the print statement before the MPI init. And you will see if you run this on four processes, you get four prints. This is to hammer home the fact that MPI init does not create the parallel processes. The parallel processes are created by your launcher program, which on, on um, Archer is AP run. There are four MPI processes running right from the start, all the way up here. So if you put a print here, you get four of them. It's just that you can't do any MPI until the init. So MPI init does not create parallel processes. It just initializes MPI. Then you do uh, I've initialized MPI. I, I, I've done this trick of just for just like neat the string com equals MPI com. Well, that does not duplicate com. Well, this is just a reference. This is Cobb is identical to Cobb, it's just a, a reference. I initialize MPI, I'm not using command line arguments. I get the size of the rank and I print hello from rank whatever. So everyone prints, and then of course in reality, all MPI codes are full of things like if rank equals zero print, because otherwise you run on a thousand process and you get a thousand prints. So there's two things to point out here. Some people think this is some sort of magic syntax. It isn't, and remember, in the SPMD model, Every single process executes this line of code. It just happens to be that only one of the processes is rank equal to zero. Okay. Well, rank. If, if I've set rank using MPI com rank. Okay. So every process executes this line. It's just that only on one process, which is rank zero, um, does it is, is that line true. Also, there is nothing special in MPI about rank zero. In MPI to first approximation, other than, other than some real 
corner cases in the standard. All, all processes are identical. The reason that people can pick rank zero as the boss is that there is always a rank zero. Even if you want on one process, there's a rank zero. But there is nothing special about a rank zero. That is totally unlike OpenMP, if you've done OpenMP programming, where thread zero is special. Thread zero is synonymous with the parent process. But in MPI, rank zero is just another rank. Yeah. And then I basically, um, as I say in the comments, um, that. Okay, now I just compute pi. And this is the SPMD model. The best way to do it is just replace your loop with a loop which has an I start and an I stop. In, in the zero code, it went from one to n. Here it goes from I start to I stop. And just compute I start and I stop differently. So I start and I stop exist in every process, but you compute them based on the rank and the size. And here I just split the, the, the iteration into blocks of n over size. And the start is that plus one, and the stop is the i start plus n over side minus one. This assumes that n divided by some, that the n is a multiple of size. But and so this code only works if you get this right, and it's easy to get this wrong by plus or minus one. It's very easy to get this wrong. And then so I've seen people stare at these kind of statements for hours. That I never just print them out. You know, if, you know. The, I know people say you shouldn't debug using printf. Yes, with your own program, you should debug using printf. If you've computed stuff on which your calculation depends, print it out and then look at it and you can debug it. Now, the other thing in MPI, you have to prepend print statements with the rank because otherwise you will, you will get a print statement, x is 73, and you're like, oh, who did that come from? Rank one, rank a million? So you have to get into the habit of prepending your prints with, with on rank whatever. <clears throat> and so we computed our partial pi, so that's the first stage. We've split the calculation up between the processes, based, and all you need to know there is the rank and size. However, then we need to accumulate them. And so I'll go down to the, I then have a, a line here, if rank equals zero, well, let's skip to the other bit. So everybody except for rank zero is sending their partial pi to rank zero. So everybody except rank zero I use synchronous send the partial value of pi, which is one double, two ranks of two rank zero within com, which is MPI com. Well, I have used the tag, I've just set tag equal zero, I'm not using the tags here. So everybody except rank zero is sending to rank zero. And then obviously rank zero has to has to receive them. And the thing which people get wrong is um, you have to explicitly do a receive for each send. So, so, so you have, if you're running on n processes, there are n minus one sends because n minus one of the processes are issuing one send. But you also have to issue n minus one receives, which means rank zero has to loop explicitly n minus one times. So, if a source equals one, source less than size towards double plus, so that skips myself. And then I receive, and here I'm using MPI any source. I'm saying I want to receive, and I call it receive pi, which is one double, from any source, and I have a status here. And the reason I've done this is, first of all, you can argue that receiving from any source is the right thing to do, because it, it, I could replace this with source. I could actually say I want to receive from one, from two, from three, from four. But, but if I'm sitting here waiting to receive a message from process one, maybe process 15 is finished. And why should I wait for process one to finish when process 15 is trying to send me something? So you can argue here that MPI any source is a better thing, but just take it from whoever's finished. But the other reason I do it here is to show you how to um, how to um, inquire on the status variable. I print out here, rank zero is receiving from rank. So, so, so I've received the message here, but where did it come from? Okay, Because I wildcarded, I, did, I don't know a priori where it came from. Well, that's stored in the status. Remember, in a receive, there are two storage spaces. One is the, the receive buffer where the data goes into. But also, there is the metadata which goes into the status. And the metadata of the status contains the envelope information about you know, where the message came from, how long it was, and stuff like that. And so status.mpi source is where it came from. And then I just add that into the running total. Pi plus pi plus receive pi. And then at the end, um, I, 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 print, I just print it out. Okay? So I'm going to run this a couple of times. But if, are there any questions about that? Yeah? Probably more of these question. Why do you use a define for n and not an integer? Uh, just um, laziness, I think. Just that's just me being lazy. Um, I, I think 
I think in one version of the program, I, I was creating arrays of side n, and then it's easy for me to have an actual file. Well, if you're a C programmer like me from the, from the 20th century, then it's easy to have an actual file. If you're a 21st century C programmer. I uh, know that's just a, I think it was just to make it really obvious. I also, just to make it really obvious to talk what it was. But no, there's no reason for it to be actual. No reason. Um, so if I just compile this, uh, which uses cc minus o in the camera alarm. C. I should have to include the maths library because I'm doing C being a very stupid language, doesn't even know how to raise things to a power. I have to play, but I think cc includes the maths library, yeah. I think if you use gcc, it would be. Um, and then if I do ap run minus n or dot slash in the camera alarm, I'm on interactive search. You'll see. Um, slightly belong to the top here. But the most important thing was that I got four prints saying computing population to pi using any because that although that print was before MPI init, the process was still running. And then I get the and you'll see that the, the output is all mixed up, okay? The output is all mixed up. So people get confused by this. You cannot so so if you've got two processes, one process produces some output and another process produces some output. For a particular process, the output will appear in order, okay? But they can be merged in any order whatsoever. People try to attribute meaning to this, saying, well, because hello came from rank two after rank zero, this was executed in time. No, no, no. The, the, the operating system is merging the output from all these parallel processes. Who knows how it does it, okay? The order that it appears, so for a particular process, the order is significant. The order is the order that's printed. But the order between two processes is totally, it has no correlation to whatsoever to when these actually rank, okay? Who knows when these print statements actually appear on the screen? So that kind of confuses people sometimes. Um, and I've got my prints that all works out, and you'll see that rank zero received from rank two, rank three, and rank one in order, okay? If I run this again, it won't necessarily receive in the same order. So there it went two, three, one. Let's see if it does it again. It does. Then it receives. So the, the order here is significant because this is a do loop on on that. Then it did three, one, two. So this is sh showing you the MPI any sort of doing its job. It is genuinely receiving from you know whoever whoever's there. So I don't want to eat up too much of Rupert's time, but the the the, 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 the um. What's that say? A laureate. Uh, the, the issue here is that you, you might worry, you will see uh, that um, if you print this out sufficient accuracy, you will see that in this version of the program, you get different, slightly different answers each time you run the program. Because because you're, you're receiving from any source, then um, you can add numbers together in different orders, and um, floating point arithmetic is not associated. A plus, so, so the order matters. People get really worried about that. They're like, oh, God. I mean, so I've never understood why people get worried about it because if you look at the serial code, okay, yeah, people say this is the correct answer. No, it isn't. Nobody told you you had to add this loop up from one to n. I can't add this, this loop up from n to one, and I've got a different answer. Okay, they're all equally right. They're all equally wrong. However, it is a concern if you run a parallel program, if you run the same executable twice on the same number of processes and you get a different answer each time, that means it's almost impossible to debug that program. How can you, so, so in fact, so there are two ways to fix this. The obvious way is to just enforce that when I do the receive, I receive from source so if I can find the receive. Rather than receive wild carding, I actually say, look, I want to receive from source. So if I recompile, which takes forever for a whole bunch of reasons that we discussed yesterday, and run again, you'll see that this time it does receive in rank order because I'm, I'm mandating that. And if you run this, you'll get the same answer. You can then argue you can get the best of both worlds and run the exercise and say, look, I'll receive from MPI any source, but rather than accumulating as I go along, I'll stick it in a little array. In the, it, it, if it came from rank three, I stick it in location three. I stick it, if it came from rank five, I stick it in location five, and add them up at the end. But you'll see in the comments here that you should never. This this is a very good training exercise. It's not a trivial program to write. However, if you really wanted to add up the partial values of pi to get the real value of pi, 
you would use a, a reduction operation. So, so you know, that's that's I put that comment in the code to say, look, but, but as, a, as, as a training exercise, this is actually a very, a, 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 a surprisingly, I think, a useful piece of code. And it is not trivial if this code works, okay? <coughs> People often wonder why there aren't um, more tools to help you debug MPI. Why can't I have a, 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 um, a tool look at my program and tell me if it deadlocks, for example? The fact that this code works is really quite subtle. It only works because, why do the sends and receives match? It works because n minus 1 processes are calling 1 receive to rank 0, and rank 0 is explicitly doing n minus 1 receives to all the other ranks. If any of those things get wrong, this program deadlocks. And there is no way that a tool could spot that for you. Because, for example, you know, the fact that I've got if rank equals zero here. Well, rank's just a variable. The fact that rank is set to MPI called rank is just my choice. I could have called this Fred or Billy or something. You know, so because MPI is, is a library and not built into the compiler, there is almost no useful static analysis you can do a program to, um, to check it's going to work. So in four, I work, the only thing I'll show in four chart thing is exactly the same. Oh, sorry. The only issue here, other than the fact that things are integers, is that, first of all, the status is an array, so the classic mistake people make, they make mistakes to scale up, and because of slight technical reasons, the compiler doesn't pick that up, unfortunately. But the main thing is, how do you dereference the status? The status is, a, is an array. So in C, it was status.mpi source. Here, if you want to find out what the source is, it's the MPI source entry of this little status array. That's really the only difference. And you have to put I errors everywhere. And you don't need to worry about putting uh, addresses or content on this thing. So, um, and there's a very verbose MPI level precision. That was really all I had to say. So, um, does anyone have any questions about that? So as I said, the, that, that code is deliberately written in a fairly verbose way, but it's there for, for a reason. So I'll now define it. OK, so I'll pass you over to Rupert. Thanks, David. I am uh, Rupert. I'm one of the um, application consultants here at UCC. Non blocking communication. So, um, deadlock is one of the problems we want to solve with this, as well as to be able to get better performance by overlapping doing the communications with actually doing some work. But from the point of point to point, um, communications lecture, we saw there are a couple of ways to send data between different ranks. Um, you can use your MPI send, which the implementation is allowed to pick any of the actual uh, methods. You say the, the real method you can use are an S send, which is a synchronous send, so that's I send a message to someone else, and that uh, subroutine call will not return until the receiver has Posted, has started to receive the message. Okay, you can do a buffered send, which is guaranteed to return quickly, and you can reuse your data as soon as that's happened. But the problem is that as the user, you've got to deal with providing enough buffer space to MPI to you keep track of that. And in general, it's a bit of a hassle, and I've never used it in a real code. Uh, you can also do a ready send, which is a send that is only valid if you know from the structure of your program that the receiver has already posted a receive. So if I were to send a message to Juan with a ready send, he had better posted the receive. Otherwise, it's an error and the program will, the whole set of processes will stop. Um, so one advice that David may have mentioned, who was doing the point to point, was it David? Yeah, uh, probably mentioned was that for writing a code, an S send is probably the best thing to use. So, let's talk about deadlock now. So, the this uh, set of processes, which are all trying to send a, a message to each other. So, every process is sending a message to the one to its right in some arbitrary order. So, if everyone is trying to send to the person to their right, 
no one can receive because everyone is doing it. So everyone will deadlock and just sit there trying to send and fail. Um, so what you can do is you can um, break the ring and if you have one of these guys just do the receive first and then the communication can go around and then afterwards it can do its uh, receive. Um, but this is going to be slow because you are uh, each uh, rank has to wait for the communications ahead of it to complete and so you're getting four parallels and there's going to be a ripple of activity going around it but most of the processes will just be waiting for most of the time that this communication is ongoing. So there are two concepts in MPI that describe how point-to-point uh, -point communication occurs. So um, the mode of the communication. So this is a formal definition of when the message uh, oper messaging operation completes. So this can be synchronous or asynchronous. So uh, a synchronous example is for example, if you make a phone call, so imagine the processes are people and you want to communicate to your neighbor, you can pick up the phone and call them. So that is a synchronous communication. You know that the communication has happened. You are both actively participating it while it's uh, going on. And then it's complete when you put the phone down. And so both processes know when the communication is uh, over. And an asynchronous one, you could think of more like uh, sending a letter or an email. So uh, your part of sending the letter is done once you put it in an envelope and put it in the post box. And then at some point in the future, MPI or the Royal Mail will deal with delivering that to the recipient, fingers crossed. Um, the second thing is the form, which uh, is when does your process, the one that's executing, when does it get back control from the MPI library? So this is basically um, when the procedure that implements that returns. So when you ex you go MP call MPI send or just in C, just MPI send on some arguments, when does your program get back to executing itself rather than sitting doing work at the library? Um, and you might expect that this will indicate when the operation is complete, but that's perhaps not uh, in general true. So a blocking operation, that's what we've used so far. This only returns to the user when the operation is complete. And uh, you know, uh, other operations we might have uh, looked at are things like writing for file. This only will return to your program once you've finished writing to the file. Um, and this is very much like uh, MPI S send or receive. Um, but if we talk about non-blocking operations, so this uses the rather old school uh, example of a fax. Uh, these slides have been around for a while. Um, so doing a blocking send is like going to the fax machine, putting your message in it, and sitting there waiting until it has gone through, and waiting for some confirmation beep to know that it has received from the other side. So. But what you could do is you could go to the fax of the machine, type the number, press send, and then go away and do something useful, and then go back later and then test or wait for, for it. So there's some little status message you can see has the fax sent. Uh, and you can test and just check, or you can wait and just stand there and say, right, okay, I really need some of that stuff to have been let by now. So the thing that you want to do is you want to you're splitting the communication into two bits. The starting it and then waiting for it to be finished. So uh, you're splitting your the, the process into two parts, the initiation and the completion. So you can perhaps do something else in between. Um, perhaps a slightly better analogy is sending a parcel via UPS, some sort of courier service. So when you send a parcel, 
with one of these services. When you deliver the parcel, you get back a little ticket that has a tracking number on it, and you can find out has this parcel been delivered yet. So this is quite a useful analogy for thinking about non-blocking uh, communications. Okay, um, and it's also probably worth mentioning that you don't choose the tracking number. You get some unintelligible string of digits. This is not a nice number seven or whatever you give to the courier, right? You get some arbitrary thing back that is meaningless unless you give it to the, the, the library, the, the communication service, uh, and ask them what's going on with that because it's just an arbitrary thing. So all of these non-blocking operations uh, need to have some sort of matching uh, wait or receive operation, which is basically you going, has this finished? Because only once you have told the library that, yes, I, I have acknowledged that this has been sent or received, can it clear up any resources that it's holding, you know, any bookkeeping data about how far has the message got through the the network cards between these different processes. So you have to um, ensure that you match every non-blocking operation with a, a wait or a test so that it, the library can clean up after itself. Um, it's also worth saying that if you do a non-blocking operation then immediately wait on it, that is exactly the same as just doing the regular blocking, send or receive. Um, you know, it's the example of going to the factory sending it and just waiting by it. And it's not the same as a sort of standard subroutine. MPI gets on with doing this in the background for you. Uh, it may, uh, there are some subtleties around that, but basically most modern MPIs will ensure that some stuff happens <coughs> in the background. So you can go send this huge chunk of data to rank number seven, and you can get on with calculating some other bit, and then it will deal with it in the background of sending it for you. And it's just worth saying, there's no magic. You have to keep track of those tracking numbers, right? You need to, when you start communication, you get the ID number back. You have to store it somewhere. You have to look after that variable, and then you have to use that data to wait on it. Yeah, okay, so. We're splitting it into the three phases. We start the communication, do some work, and then we wait on it. So let's just go through the non-blocking send a bit. So this is um, a bit like an outbox, right? So it's not the same as a buffered send because it does not copy the data for you, right? So a common mistake is to update the data. So if I have an array, that I want to send to Quang, I just tell the MPI library, send this array, okay, and it will get on with doing it in the background, but while it's doing it, I can't use that array, I can't write to it, I could read from it if I wanted to, if that was relevant, but I couldn't go and start filling in the next time step or iteration of that array thing, yes? Could you write a sort array, a subset of that array, Okay, yeah, so you could have a very large array, for example, and you could say to MPI, send the first half, and then you could write into the second half. Yeah, you could certainly do that, okay? Um, because what you say to MPI is, isn't send this array, it's send this data in memory that I'm referencing, and that's especially clear if you're uh, using C, it's less clear if you're using Fortran, but under the hood, yes, that is what's happening. The difficulty surrounds that you might have a, a more complicated thing to send, because if you use MPI data types that will deal with later today, it could be that actually what you're sending is every other item in that array, and yeah, of course you could then fill in the gaps, but it's getting pretty confusing. And as a first approximation, it's, that's advanced uh, stuff to be sending, to be filling in another part of the array that you know will not be touched by the send. For the first time around, I suggest not doing that. Okay, so yeah, if I'm sending it, I've, I've marked some piece of data as to be sent, and it gets on with sending it. And um, 
The other thing you can do is you can do a non lock and receive. So this is more like placing a tray out, setting up your mailbox, right? So I, I don't have any in trays or out trays, but you know, you can say, MPI, please put a message in there and uh, receiving from rank number 18 and or any source or whatever, and then MPI will come in and fill that in for you. Okay, it will deliver the message that's a matching message. Um, and again, you need to make sure that MPI is finished before you start reading from that date because, you know, it may have only filled in half of it, and if you then start using it, you don't know what the state is. So again, you have to wait on this receive being completed before you use the results. So these sort of tracking things that the MPI standard talks about as being handles. So um, you need to supply uh, an MPI data type or an integer type code for Fortran programmers um, that is exactly the same as you've dealt with for uh, the blocking communication. So you say send some MPI ints or some MPI double precisions. Um, communication is exactly the same, it's just an MPI com or a communicator ID number. Um, and then the new one is the request handle. And this is allocated when the communication is uh, a non-blocking communication is initiated. So it's an MPI underscore request type in C or just an integer type code ID number in Fortran. And you need, you need to allocate a variable to store that. And you need to make sure that you keep that value around until you've waited on the communication being complete. So the library will give you the value, the ticket ID number uh, that is uh, appropriate for that communication that matches that communication. So, uh, an example of the non blocking synchronous set. So, we've got the MPI prefix and then the I. So, all of these non blocking rules are prefixed with an I. And the I stands for immediate. And that doesn't mean the communication happens immediately, it means that you immediately get back control from the library, your program gets back control. So it spends a very small amount of time in that function call and just basically initiates the communication but doesn't make much uh, progress towards it. Um, you provide the buffer data that you want to send, an integer count of the number of items, the data type, the rank of your destination, a tag, number for the communication, what your communicator is, and then a pointer to an MPI request object. Okay? So before you do this, you need to declare an MPI request and then provide the address of it to this thing because it's a pointer to a request because it needs to know where to fill, fill that in in memory. And then the matching wait call is just you get the, um, the request that you want to wait, wait on, the pointer to it, and then um, an MPI status which I think we've seen before. Um, if we're in Fortran land, it's exactly the same. MPI, I for immediate, synchronous send. You've got your buffer, how many items, their type, where to send it, the tag number, the communicator ID number, your request ID number, and uh, the error code for all of the Fortran ones, except some argument. And then you wait on it exactly the same way. So it's request, status, and then error code again. Okay, so um, a receive, so it's an MPI immediate receive, where to put the answer, how many, what type, where from, tag number, communicator, and then again, a pointer to the request. And yep, four trans, the same, buffer, number, type, where from, tag ID, communicator ID, request ID, and error code. And, um, <coughs> You might notice there's something missing from the received calls that we've seen from the point-to-point -point communications. Any argument that's missing? Anyone? Yes. So the status, right? 
because this isn't complete yet, so there's no status available. So the status is filled in when you wait on it. Okay? So um, you also get the status when you wait on a send. Okay? Um, and it's worth pointing out that request, you don't need to know what type of request it is, right? MPI behind the scenes will keep track of, oh, that's a send to so and so, right? That's all parceled up into the request uh, handle that is totally opaque and meaningless to a user, right? It's an internal detail of the library that you should not have to care about. Okay, so um, just a little summary. So blocking and non-blocking. A send and receive can be either blocking or non-blocking, and you can have a blocking send, and you can have the other side of it be a non-blocking receive, or the other way around, I can make a non-blocking send, and uh, it will have a blocking receive waiting on it. Um, non-blocking sends can use any of the modes. It can be synchronous, buffered, the standard pick something, and the ready send, right? Um, and the synchronous mode, whether it's blocking or non-blocking, affects only the completion of the request, not how it starts it. Okay, so the, um, the, the mode, whether it's a, a S send, a B send, or an R send, okay, that's how you start the communication, really. And the synchronousness only really affects the completion. So really the point is the two ends of a communication do not have to have the same blockingness. Oh yeah, so just a quick summary. So it's a standard send where it will pick something that the library decides is appropriate is an I send, synchronous non-blocking send, a non-blocking buffered send, which is really unusual to see, uh, a non-blocking ready send, and then the receive. Um, yeah. So just um, a little bit about completion there. So talking about the difference between waiting and testing. So uh, a wait, you hand in the request and the status object, the request handle, the status handle, and error code. And that will just sit there until the communication is completed, or wait forever if no valid, no match of communication has been. Uh, if the other side of that communication has never been um, initiated by the other end of the, the, the phone line or whatever. Um, so, you know, if you've done all the available work that there is in your program before you need that answer, then you may just have to wait. Um, but, you know, sometimes you can um, you can just test the, the, the communication every now and then and get on with another thing. So an example would be um, something like sort of task farm type uh, communication program where one, one node is the master and it sends out jobs of work to everyone and it's like, have you finished, have you finished, has anyone finished using MPI any source? And then you do take that result and do something with it and then um, send more work out to the person who said, I've done my job. It's not possible to cancel these requests. You send them out and they haven't been accepted yet. And one of the jobs returns and says, oh, well, I haven't answered your question. But you can cancel requests to all the other ones. Yes, you can, but it's a can of worms. Because, so I send a message to you, and I test it, I test it, and it's still going, and I'm going, right, okay, we'll send that job to someone else, I go cancel. So I have to then do some communication with you. So the MPI library on my end, and the MPI library on your end, have to agree. This message, is it received, or is it not? Okay, so there's extra communication, there's a lot of extra bookkeeping, and the logic to deal with that inside your program is also going to have to be quite complicated. So again, like racing into one part of the array while it's still being, the other part is being sent. It's an advanced feature that you can in principle do. I have never ever used an MPI cancel. Well, have you ever used an MPI cancel? 
Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so it's a perfectly reasonable question, but not one that comes up a lot in real code. Um, so, as an example here, what's going on? So, this is two processes. Um, rank zero is making a send. Rank one is doing receive. So, we set up the request and the status things. So, um, rank zero executes the code where it goes. Ah, my rank is zero. I'm going to send to rank one uh, 10 integers, which presumably have been set up. So you call some other function to do some meaningful work, I guess, and then we wait on it. So it's the same, it's the request objects that uh, I declared here and allocated some space for, but then filled in a value here. So uh, I'm waiting on it here, I get some status back, and that's done. So if I'm rank one, I go through the program, oh, skip that bit, go to here, oh, I can execute this one. So I'm doing an I receive into a sum array, 10 items of integer from uh, rank zero. So then get on with doing some other work, and then I wait for things to happen. So um, yeah, again, this is uh, drilling in the point that it's the request doesn't have to be a special type for a send or receive. It's exactly the same type uh, for you. There may be something behind the scenes that's different about them. Presumably, so MPI knows what's what, but you don't care as a user of MPI. Um, and we've got exactly the same for the Fortran programmers here. So we're setting up our request. We're setting up the array of integers that is an MPI status, so that the MPI status size. Rank zero, we call the send, do some other work, then we wait on it. Then if we're rank one, the code file skips that one, comes to here. So we're calling I receive, do some other work, wait for it to be done, and then we're we finish this set uh, part of the code. Hi. Um, is the is the key point there in order to get us some kind of so there are two main reasons to use non block mode. One is that. So this is overlap of communication and computation, okay, is the sort of phrase people use to describe it. And you know, if you are sending large messages to other processes, this takes time because it's a finite bandwidth. So if you're doing a lot of that, you're wasting time that you could be spent crunching numbers with your very expensive uh, CPUs. Uh, and equally, if you're doing a lot of computation and not sending stuff over your very expensive network that supercomputers have, you are wasting the hardware that the research councils have bought for us. So overlapping these things is the way to get the best out of everything. But equally, if we go back to the very first slide, it's the deadlock issue, right? So if everyone in that ring does a non-blocking send to the person to their right, okay, and then, then they do, say, a blocking receive from their left, everyone can make progress there, right? And then you just, after you've received, you wait on your send to the other person, the person on your right um, being finished. So that, that ring that we had back on one of the early slides, okay, this is not a deadlock, right? Because the the flow of control in your program returns to you immediately after you call the send. Okay. So they're the two biggest reasons for using these non-blocking communications, and they. Was, was it securing the non-blocking piece of code? Uh, who is executing? Did you say that the MPI takes care of it in the background, or in the background? So this this is an implementation detail you shouldn't have to care too much about. So in reality, what happens is for smallish messages, most supercomputers have special hardware that will run the network card will just go black block of data, send it to whoever, right? So MPI will call whatever special magic 
subroutines that interact with the hardware and get it to do the job for you so the CPU doesn't have to do anything. Other implementations will have a thread running in the background that belongs to MPI and deals with this. Others won't, and it will just be every time you make any MPI call, it will just go, do a bit more of all my outstanding non-blocking communication. So every time you call an MPI test or an MPI get my rank even, right? It could, in principle, make a little bit of progress on doing these communications. Chris, is there any way that MPI can test whether the communication has been received in full? Apologies if you may say So I'm thinking, like, can it be working? I mean, at the end of an iteration, for example, have I got what I'm expecting yet? And then continue to set the iteration. If not, or is that... Uh, I don't think I understand your question quite right. So are you saying, can MPI know when a communication is complete? So if I'm sending you a message, can I know when that's complete? Yeah, so if yes. Yes. Unlocking message coming through. Yeah. So that's what it's an MPI test or wait is doing. So okay. a test says, has that communication referenced by the MPI request handle? Has that finished? Because okay. you know. It, if you think about it at the lowest hardware level, there's actually quite a lot back and forth to send a message. So even just a simple send, I have to package it up, I have to say to you, there's the message coming. You have to go, okay, I'm ready to receive it. Yep, send that back, status code back. Then I actually send it, and then you have to send back. So there's potentially quite a lot back and forth at the lowest level that you don't have to really care about. Okay, so just forget that. Okay, think about what the library is promising. And, um, Variant. Variant is a strong word. Right. <laughs> when you say you can't override the memory, you just send an I send. Sorry? When you say you can't override the memory, you or, or shouldn't override the memory of an I send, is it that you shouldn't or you can't? You shouldn't. <coughs> so you can't, there's nothing to stop you. Yes, but then you will blocking. then you may get nonsense behavior, yeah, right? Because you know just you don't know where MPI has got to in sending this. You have no way of knowing. So, program won't crash or just Yes, which is even worse than a crash, right? Because you know, you're doing your expensive communication to write your thesis or publish some papers. You know, you do not want those answers to be wrong unless you know about them, right? So it's better for a program to crash than to give you a wrong answer. Okay, well Okay, so yeah, uh, multiple communications. So you can obviously have a lot of these um, non blocking send or receive requests in flight at one time, right? So going back to the task farm example, I could have sent a message to every single uh, worker in this room. Hello, workers, sorry. Um, and I want to know if all of them have completed or if any of them have completed. So there are MPI calls that will deal with that. We can Wait all, or wait some, or wait any. Um, so that's what these are. So one message, you can just either do, if you want to wait on one particular message, you just call the regular MPI wait. If you want all, you have MPI wait all, or test all. Test all, wait for as many as possible. You've got uh, wait some, and uh, yeah, wait any or wait for any one individual message to um, communication. Sorry, to have completed. Yeah. So, for example, this thing I posted three uh, non-blocking receives. I set out three in trays, and I can examine the status of any particular one, any one of three, as many as possible, or all of them. I can. Uh, you can say to MPI, um, you can ask for all of those things. So one thing you can do is um, use the combine send and receive. Um, so you specify all of these arguments in one call and the implementation, the library will deal with avoiding deadlock for you. So this is basically gluing together of a send and receive to the same rank. So if I have a message to exchange with Juan, we could use a send receive call 
to deal with this, and MPI will avoid any deadlock issues. How it does it, you do not need to know. I don't know how it does it. Um, and this is quite useful for simple pairwise communications, but it's not generally applicable in the same way that non-blocking um, sends and receives are. So we've got a lot of arguments here. We have what we're sending, how many times it's type, where to, a send tag, then we've got what we're receiving, count of them, number of them, type of them, where from, and a tag for receiving the communicator, and then you've got a status object, because it's just like a send, so there has to be a status object. And the Fortran, exactly the same, except with the addition of the error code argument. Um, So the exercise, which is um, rotating some information around the ring. So if you look at your sheet on uh, the exercise sheet number four, and what we want to think about is communication around the ring. Okay, so yeah, so let's have a crack at this um, exercise, and what you want to do is. Uh, print out the sum that's stored at each process. So if this is the rank, then you can use um, the standard is it Leibniz formula, half n, n plus one, or half n, n minus one, I can remember what it is, to work out what the total should be. I think it's actually on your excess one. And yeah, so you've got several possible solutions, but the only thing is at least one of the communications has to be uh, a non-blocking one. But you could do both as non-blocking. So yeah, and um, some other notes. So you're you're always receiving from the same other rank from your left and your right, and you don't alter the data you receive. You receive it, you add it to your running total, and then you pass that same number unchanged around the ring. And again, you must not access the send or receive buffers until the communication is known to be complete. 